Let's put our hands together for the worship team leading us so wonderfully this morning into his presence. <laughs> yeah, put, it, put your hands together for the worship team. Isn't it just so wonderful that, uh, uh, you know, that God isn't a hard taskmaster, that he opens a space for us just to relax in his love, to rest in his presence, like that song that we just sung. It's just so wonderful to be able to do that. It's in that place we get transformed and renewed. And I don't know about you, but I, I need a bit of that. This week, I, I came down with a dreaded flu lurgy, and so I spent most of this week in bed. And so uh, we'll see how the message goes. Uh, I haven't had a lot of time to prepare, so I need a lot of amens, okay, a lot of encouragement. Amen. Yeah, 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 keep working on that, uh, but, um, but I'm excited because we are continuing our series, uh, jumping back. Who enjoyed Joe last week? Such a great word on truth. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate uh, whenever Joe comes to share. Uh, today we are jumping back into our series on the Beatitudes of Christ found in Matthew 5. And uh, our series, of course, is called How to Be Happy. You want to say how to be happy? There's a few smiles. It's good. Good to see a few smiles in church. Uh, but the reality is, is that no generation on the face of the planet has had so much and yet been so unhappy. Meaningful, lasting happiness just seems so elusive in this world, doesn't it? But Jesus, praise God, has given us a roadmap on how to be happy. In the Beatitudes, we've discovered that the word blessed, uh, in the Greek it's the word makarios. You want to say makarios? It's a good one to clear your throat on. Uh, it simply means happy. It just means happy. And uh, not talking about just frivolous, fleeting happiness, but it's a happiness that is lasting and meaningful. So as we dive into the Word this morning, uh, let's read through the Beatitudes again. So maybe you want to read along in your own Bibles in Matthew 5 from verse 1, uh, or I'll put them up on screen for you as well. Here we go from verse 1, Matthew 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For, uh, sorry, for they will be for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your word. And sometimes we look at these uh, blessed, we look at these beatitudes, and um, Lord, that can be an enigma, sometimes a little bit confusing. What, what are you saying to us? And Lord, as we uh, have been going through these, thank you that you've been opening your word to us. And Lord, as we continue this morning, I pray God for just a spirit of revelation to really be able to grab a hold, Lord, of what you're showing us in your word today. In Jesus' wonderful name, everyone said, well, how are we going in this How to Be Happy series? We've covered the first five. Uh, I believe it's five, maybe six by now. I, I'm, I've lost count. No, it's five. I think we've done five. Are we doing okay? Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, all of these are up on, online. So if you've missed any, I encourage you to jump in into these because I don't know about you, but I've been really blessed. And the more I've dug into these, I think we covered the first three in the first sermon. And uh, from then on, we've been sort of hitting them almost one at a time. And today we are just going to be hitting one because I've discovered that in each of these Beatitudes, there's like a whole world in there that uh, God wants to speak and to minister to us. And so today we're simply looking at this statement where Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Have you ever noticed that there are those people in church who just seem to see God in everything? You know, just kind of see God in everything, you know, and it's, it's like, you know, that they, they, they get caught in bad traffic. It's, oh, praise the Lord. You know, he's going to get me there in the right time. I, I can see God's hand in this big you know, RV in front of me, keeping me from where I need to go. It's like, you know, we, we have people like, people like Delia here, you know, it's just, yeah, you know, I put too much milk in her tea. So, Praise the Lord, God is, speak, He's a God of abundance. Yeah. And just see, see God kind of in everything, 
that happens. You know, it's like it's a rainy, cloudy day. Praise the Lord. God is with me in the, my warm, cozy. The sun is shining. Praise the Lord. This is a glory. It's like just sort of see God's hand in every situation and everything that, that happens. But, but then there are the people kind of more towards the other side who kind of don't see God in anything, you know, kind of struggle to see God in their situation, kind of always got that sort of angst of like, God, where are you? God, why have you forsaken me? God, what's going on here? And maybe you find yourself maybe somewhere between those, yeah? Maybe, maybe some of us are sort of more just seeing God's hand and everything. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Maybe some of us are a bit more kind of drawn towards the melancholy. God, my God, why have thou art forsaken me? <laughs> Don't you see me going through what I'm going? And, and, and we can sort of find ourselves on this scale. But Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He begins with our hearts. If we want to become people who see God's hand, to see what God is doing in us and around us more of the time, then Jesus points us to this, to our hearts. The heart is absolutely central as we see throughout the scriptures. See, God is concerned with our hearts, not just our behavior. Sometimes in church, we talk a lot about our behavior and our actions and our spiritual disciplines and all, all the do's and shoulds that we, we know as Christians. But God, all the while, He is looking at this. He's looking at the heart. Whether you're able to accomplish all those do's and shoulds or not, He's interested in this. He only cares about what's going on in here. What are your motivations? What is going on in the place of your heart? See, our hearts are who we truly are, right? Our hearts are who we truly are. It's the part of us that will live on forever. It's the place of our desires, the place of our longings. The Scripture tells us that out of the outflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We are to love the Lord with all of our heart. We're taught to guard our heart for, uh, for it's the wellspring of life, isn't it? It's what comes out of the heart that can defile a person. To hate someone is to commit murder in your heart. God says, if you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's the place where we can connect with God. We connect with the divine in this place of our hearts. Our hearts are important. Our hearts are absolutely central and key to all of life and especially to the key of how to be happy. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He says, happy are the pure in heart. I wonder, is there anyone here who can claim to have a pure, pristine heart? Anyone with a, a, a clean heart this morning? I'm not seeing too many hands going up this morning. Was it? Was it I see this, the kids are raising their hands. It's good to see you. You probably have as well. But you know, can anyone claim truly to, to have a pure heart, to have never, never have hated someone, never have lusted? Never have envied or judged somebody from your heart. Can anyone just say that since they woke up this morning? Can any of us claim pure hearts? But there's a trap here. And I want to warn you about this trap because I've seen so many Christians walk along and fall into this very trap. When our hearts condemn us and we know we're not what we were made to be, we're not who God wants us to be, and many good-hearted believers have done exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They try to cover up themselves with the fig leaf of religion. We grab for the nearest thing. We want to hide. That's our instant response. God's instant response is to come after us like he did in the garden. Adam, Eve, where are you? But our, our instinct is to, to hide behind the fig leaf of religion. Many good-hearted believers get caught in this counterfeit religious version of Christianity. And if there's one thing that Jesus didn't like, I mean, he welcomed sinners. He welcomed the broken. He welcomed the rich and the poor. His arms were wide open, but when it came to the religious, he had a problem. Because this religious version of Christianity rips us off so badly, where the focus becomes more on beliefs and behavior, having right beliefs and, and, and the right behavior over the life that comes from the Spirit that we are to focus on. It's where our Christianity becomes a game of sin management, like shifting deck chairs around on the Titanic, not ever dealing with the real problem, which is in our hearts. Jesus constantly used to butt heads with a group called the Pharisees. You read about them? 
You'd love to pray on the street corners and make a show of their religious practice. And, and they were good. They kept the, the righteous requirements of the law of Moses to a T, even tithing their spices. I haven't seen any of you put spices in the offering box yet. These Pharisees would major on the minors, would elevate rules over relationship and focus on outward behavior instead of inward purity, which is what we've said God is looking for. If the world says you need to change your circumstances in order to be happy, the religious would say you need to change your behavior if you're going to be happy. And we live under this taskmaster of become something better, do more work more, strive more, and we get trapped in this religious performance that even as Christians, and we can live so far from the life that God intended for us, the abundant life, the life to the full, the life that is so free in the grace of Jesus, we end up living in this place of, of re the religious counterfeit of Christianity. And we think it's Christianity because it sounds good. The Pharisees sounded amazing. The whole community looked up to them and thought these are the epitome of what it is to be spiritual. And yet Jesus called them out, called them a brood of vipers. If the world says you need to change your circumstances to be, to be happy, if the religious say you need to change your behavior to be happy, Jesus says what we really need is a change of heart. Can someone say amen to that? He points to this. He points to the heart. We need a change of heart if we're truly to have a meaningful, lasting, happy life. So that's the trap, but here's the problem. We're all powerless to actually change our hearts. <laughs> None of us have the power to change our own hearts. You can't make yourself more holy or more loving or more forgiving. We can try, and that's noble. But again, we can just kind of end up in that, that trap and end up like a Pharisee. If we, if we win, we get self-righteous and self-conceited. Look at me. I am so loving and forgiving. I am incredible. I am super Christian. I even prayed this morning before the sun rose. You know, it's like we can get all trapped in, in that. Or we fail and, we, and we, we come under condemnation and beating ourselves up. So we're powerless to change the thing that needs to change our hearts and nowhere better. This, Paul actually expressed the struggle, doesn't he? In Romans 7, uh, I'll just read like verse 15, he says, I do not understand what I do. Anybody else? <laughs> For what I want to do, the right thing I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And he's in this conundrum that I think we can all relate to. And rather than falling into the trap of, well, I'm just going to become this religious thing and clean up the outside, you know, knowing there's all kinds of junk on the inside, but no one can see that. So I'm going to come to church. I'm going to smile. I've got my Bible under my arm. I'm going to look the part. I'm going to do all the right religious things. But deep in my heart, I know something's not quite right. Deep in my heart, I don't have that freedom. We sing these songs about rejoicing in the Lord and resting in His presence. But all I sense is exhaustion and, and failure and disappointment. And, and I'm struggling on the inside, but not on the outside. Things are great. We can fall into that religious trap. We're powerless to change our own hearts. So what is the answer? What is, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, but none of us have pure hearts. What's the answer? And I think a part of the answer is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And I'll read from the message paraphrase. It says this, may God himself, just let those words settle in, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Notice it doesn't start with you. It doesn't say, may you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. May you pull your socks up. May you strive a little harder. May you white knuckle it and get through. May you read a book on self-improvement and become a better Christian. No, no. May God himself. Where's the focus? It's on him. He is the one who makes us holy. Our purity comes from God, the one who is pure. Our holiness comes from God, the one who is holy. In Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? In the Old Testament, we get this picture. The Garden of Eden was on the top of a mountain. And, and mountains were where you go because they're high up. Uh, that, that somehow we're closer to God. That was the place where they would bring sacrifices, whether it was pagan or the Israelites to Yahweh. This is the place where we would go to meet God on the mountain. 
And of course, God did meet the Israelites on a mountain, didn't he? With fire and billows of smoke and things we read in the Old Testament. And the, the psalmist here is reflecting on that. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, speaking of the place of His presence, of, of being able to stand in the Creator's holy presence? Who can do it? Who can stand in that incredible place, face to face with Yahweh, face to face with God Himself? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. There it is again, a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol, or swear by a false god. That's putting our trust in, in other things. There it is again, the, this, this thing of, a, of having a pure heart, which we've all gone, no, that's none of us. So what do we do? It says, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is, everyone say such is. Oh my goodness, the first time I read this, I remember this just jumping off the page for me. Such is the generation of those who seek Him who seek your face, God of Jacob. And I love the fact that he uses God of Jacob because Jacob was a rat bag. <laughs> He's the one who deceived his brother out of his birthright, who, who, who deceived his father about who he, he was, who, who ran for his life and, and, and did all kinds of stupid things. Anybody else? You know, we're all in that, we're all in that category of just being human. But this God of the Jacobs, the God of us ordinary, you know, full of faults kind of people, just human beings, such is the generation of these Jacobs who seek Him, who seek your face. See, our purity of heart does not come from ourselves. It comes from seeking the one who is holy. Purity of heart uh, is to want just one thing. It's not about moral perfection. Purity of heart is not moral perfection. It's about wanting one thing. It's about making Him our one thing, to seek Him, to seek His presence. That word, your face, that's where we get the word presence from. It could be translated face or presence. Uh, what does it say? Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your presence, God of Jacob. See, David, he was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? But he was a rat bag too. He certainly wasn't morally perfect by any means. However, he made God's presence his one thing. And God says, yeah, this one I esteem. This one has a pure heart, a man after my own heart. And we can look at him and go, no, he's not. He killed somebody. No, he's not. He committed adultery. He did some terrible things. God. Don't you see his record? And, and that's what we do to ourselves. We look at our record and go, no, we're not. Look at my record. But God says, no, when you seek me, then you become holy. Not through your striving, not through religious performance, but through seeking me because He is our purity. He is our holiness. He alone is our righteousness. And we need that deep on the inside of us, especially when we mess up. When you really feel like, oh, I've blown that. I shouldn't have said that. We come away from a conversation and go, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. When we just, when we blow it in some area of our life, we fall over again. And, and that's the moment we need to remind ourselves, I'm just as righteous now as I was before I did that thing because my righteousness does not come from me or my religious performance. I have no more right to beat myself up when I do wrong than I do to feel self-righteous when I do right. What I need is Him. We need to reject the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where all that stuff comes from, and go to the tree of life who is Jesus and receive more of His life. When we're broken, when we're struggling, when we feel like we can't do it in our own strength, that's good. The Bible says, you're called human. And in that place, that's where we go, God, I can't do it without you. God, I'm not going to focus on me. It's all because of you. I can be holy. I can be righteous. Lord, I need impart your holiness to me again. Man, the amount of times I pray that, God, will you impart your purity into my heart again? See, it can't come through our human striving. It can't come through our good works. It must come by being imparted through seeking Him. And as we do that, we go from a positional righteousness where we're declared righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross and nothing can change that to righteous in our experience as we seek Him and walk with Him and talk with Him and read His Word and allow Him to transform us as we stand in that place of worship and you think, my goodness, why doesn't Josh just move on to the next song already? Because he knows in this place when God is hovering, when the Spirit of God is moving, that's the place where we behold Him 
face to face. That is the place where we're changed from glory to glory. I discovered very early on going to Christian conferences that it was never the messages, no matter how great they were, that changed my life. It was the worship times. It was at conference because normally every morning, afternoon, and night, you're in that place of just worshiping Him, singing out the songs. And you might have sung the songs a hundred times before, but when His presence comes, transformation happens here because what's happening? He's imparting His purity, His righteousness into our hearts. Have you know, it's very hard to lie when you've just been in His presence. It's very hard to fly off the handle when you've just been spending time in the presence of the Prince of Peace because He imparts to us His purity. He is the one who is holy. Our holiness comes from His indwelling. You know, the temple they built, Joe took us through a, a beautiful short teaching at the start of his message last week about the structure of the temple. You know what made it holy? It was the dwelling presence of God that made it holy. And it's the same for us because who's the temple of God now? Our hearts. Our hearts are made holy by His indwelling. As we behold Him, we become like Him. So happy are those who seek God for who He is, not just for what He can do for them. I think that's what He's talking about. When, Blessed are those who are pure in heart. No, not, not, the, not the religion. He wasn't talking about the Pharisees. Oh, so pure and so no self-righteous, full of conceit and pride. No, He's saying, blessed are those such as the generation who seek God genuinely, humbly, seeking Him on a daily basis, not just for what He can do for them, but for himself for his seeking his face and not his hand have you heard that before seeking God's face and not his hand so often we we want God will you do this God will you do that will you fix this will you heal me will you will will you provide for this and of course he's a loving father he loves to answer our requests but he loves it more when we come to him just for him just like come on us dads we love it when our kids don't just come for us because they want something but because they just want to be with us just hang out with us right just tell us that they love us freely from uh, their hearts our little Zoe is addicted to that at the moment. <laughs> I think she tells me that she loves me about 10 times a day, and it's wonderful. I love it. How much more does our Heavenly Father just love it when we come, God, I don't need another thing. You provided your son on the cross. I'm forgiven. I have eternal life. God, can I just enjoy your presence for a while? Can I just seek your beauty and your holiness, your radiance and your goodness? Open the eyes of my heart because, Lord, as I do, I know your purity, your beauty, it begins to get transformed into this. And my heart that might feel tired, it might feel old, it might feel defiled, it might feel broken. Lord, it begins to get healed. God, it begins to get cleansed. God, renewal begins to happen as I seek you. Take me into that place. Happy are those who seek God for who he is, not just for what he can do for them, for they will see God. I want to ask you a question. What comes into your mind? when you imagine what God looks like. When you conceptualize God, Yahweh, the King of glory, when you conceptualize Him, when you imagine God, what does He look like? And without sort of pre-thinking it and kind of, you know, trying to adjust, just what naturally comes to you. When you're singing those songs of worship, what are you imagining maybe in your mind's eye as you're singing to the Lord? When you pray, what do you imagine? How do you conceive God? I know sometimes with groups, small groups and youth groups, we've done, we've given them bits of paper and a pen and say, draw what, what, what you think God might, a representation of what God might look like. And people draw all kinds of, you know, pictures of God's big and I'm little over here and, you know, all kinds of ways that we, we see God. But all of us perceive God in, in some way, even as believers, as Christians, we've all had different experiences of God. Is God, is, is God impersonal? Is He grand and, and, and mighty? Almighty, is He out there? Or is He personal to you? When you look at His face, is, is He smiling? Or is He stern? Is he, or is He maybe a little bit grumpy? Or is He just indifferent? What do you see? What do you imagine when you imagine God? What does He look like? I want you to think about that right now. Maybe just close your eyes. Think, what do I think when I imagine God? For they will see God. The great A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I love that statement. I think how true is it? Everything flows from how we think our relationship with our Creator is. It's the start point for how we relate to, to God, to ourselves, 
to others and to the world around us, it all begins with how we see God. If we see Him as a mean taskmaster, how are we going to see ourselves? How are we going to start treating other people in our world? What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Jesus came to show us exactly what God is like. Isn't it wonderful? I don't know about you, sometimes you read the Old Testament and think, my goodness, what is going on there? That doesn't sound like the Lord. Elijah casting down fire and burning up legions of, of soldiers. Now Jesus finally came and said, no, no, I don't, I don't call down fire. That's not the spirit I'm of. He came to reveal God to us, and he said, God is like this. He's like a loving father. He's a father who absolutely loves you. He's strong, but he doesn't use his strength against you. He uses it to protect you. He uses it to go lower than you, to lift you up. The Bible says in the Psalms, he stoops down to make us great. What a humble God. And then he came and washed the feet of his disciples, those dirty Middle Eastern feet of his disciples. And he's still doing it today. But the Old Testament says you can't see God and live. There's a number of times that it says you cannot see God and live. And they lived in this fear that if somehow they accidentally stumbled into the Holy of Holies, like Joe talked about last week, that they would see God and, you know, it'd be over. <laughs> it's terminal if you see God. But Jesus came and he said this. He said this, the moving of the Spirit, it's like the wind. We've had a lot of wind lately, haven't we? A lot of wind blowing around. He says, it's like the wind. You can't see it with your natural eyes, but you can see its effects and you can feel it when it blows on you. So you can see God working and you can feel His presence. Happy are those who seek God for who He is, not just for what He can do for them, for they will perceive and experience more of God. They will begin to see Him even in the things that didn't quite go the way you planned or the way you wanted them to go. You go, you know what? God's hand is in this. I didn't want this thing to happen in my family, but God is in it. And God works all things together for good. Amen? And we begin to hear His voice and, and recognize the nudge when we're in that place where we haven't been seeking the Lord and we're just asking, why, why, why? We miss so much. God's so often speaking through our, our circumstances, through our, our children, through other people, through, God forbid, the television. He can speak through all kinds of different ways. When we're open, when we've been seeking Him, when we've been pursuing Him, He imparts to us a pure heart, and then we begin to see with pure eyes. It's like when you've got to clean your glasses off. I know Emma likes to, to, to have these little wipes. She's got these little packets with wipes in them for her. She's got one in her hand right now for her glasses because she has to wear glasses all the time. <laughs> Just saying, I don't. But uh, but she has to, you know, open these little packets. She, she's wiping her glasses, and she's always like, "Would you like me to wipe your glasses? Would you like me to wipe your sunglasses?" And and she likes wiping glasses. And and it's one when she does, it's like, "Oh, that's much better." You know, mine get all oily and spots and bugs stuck to them and things. And, and isn't it wonderful when suddenly you can see clearly again? That's what happens in the eyes of our spirit when we've been seeking the Lord, when we've been reading His Word, rather than just watching leaders' debates on TV, we've been burying our, our face in the book. Then it's like the, the eyes of our hearts get cleansed. Our hearts become pure and we begin to see God in others, even our enemies. We begin to see God in our situation, even the tough situations. We begin to perceive God, and then we begin to feel Him moving on us. That even what we're walking through may not be nice. It might be wonderful, but we feel God with us. And it's not just a theoretical, well, I believe because, you know, I read, I, it said it, I read it, I believe it stuff. It's actually, I feel the presence of God with me. I have the grace. I have the strength. I have the ability to do whatever I need to do because God, God gives me all strength in Christ. Amen. And so I'm finished. Um, Joseph McCauley, Dr. Joseph McCauley, is a pastor in Tauranga in the Assemblies of God. He's actually on the executive. And he paraphrased this beatitude, blessed are the, uh, the pure in heart for they will see God. And he, he paraphrased it this way. Flourishing are those who have cultivated an inner disposition that is holy, whole, and wholesome. God's presence, God's voice, and God's action in the world 
will be keenly obvious to them. You don't want to live like that? Where God's moving, His voice is keenly obvious from the moment you wake up in the morning to when you, your head hits the pillow at night. If that's what you want, why don't you stand to your feet? Why don't you close your eyes just where you are? Let's do some heart work this morning. So maybe some of you are feeling like, my heart isn't right. My heart isn't in a good place. Maybe you've been using a fig leaf of religion and feeling like um, it's through your religious performance, whether you're doing well or badly, um, has been the answer and it's leaving you disappointed and leaving a bad taste in your mouth. But wherever you are right now, let's just bring our hearts before the Lord. I want to ask you the question, how is your heart right now? How is it? How's your heart doing? It's central. It's absolutely vital. It's the thing that hell wars against. And it's the thing that heaven wars over. Who's going to win your heart? Because your heart determines your destiny. Your heart determines the direction of your life. Your heart determines heaven or hell. Your heart determines how you relate to God and others. Your heart is central. And the Bible says that your heart, it can be defiled, it can be broken, it can grieve, it can be, become discouraged. So all kinds of things can happen to your heart. How's your heart right now? Just how's your heart right now? And I want you to bring your heart, maybe you imagine it, maybe you want to put your hands out in front of you, but just bring your heart to God. He sees everything. He sees the secret thoughts of your heart, the desires of your heart. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. And He loves you. He loves you completely. He's the only one who sees you fully. And He loves you completely. So you're in a safe place to bring your brokenness, your griefs, your disappointments, your heart aches, your struggles to Him. And this is a good moment as you bring your heart before your loving Heavenly Father just to remove the fig leaf of religious performance and sin management. If, if that's been there, just say, God, I just give you the fig leaf. I hand it over. God, I just want to get real. I want to get honest. I don't want to play Christian games. I don't want to get stuck in this cycle of, of bl blowing it, getting forgiven, feeling great, and then blowing it again, having to grovel, get forgiveness, Make up for it, feel great, blow it again. I don't want that cycle anymore. Jesus, I give you the religious fig leaf of my performance. I cannot do it on my own. I'm helpless without you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Just give it to him. Jesus, we repent of the religious counterfeit of this Christian life. We turn from the tree of good and evil and we run to the tree of life, to the cross where we find grace and forgiveness, where our hearts are transformed. And now as you hold your heart before the Lord, we ain't just determined to make Him your one thing. Maybe your heart's been cluttered with all kinds of issues and things going on. Maybe in your family, in your work, in your situation, just in your own mind, about your future, about your past. Our hearts can become very busy with all kinds of things and our trust can become in ourselves and can become in our things that we have in our bank account and our jobs. Our trust can be put in a politician. But right now, I want you to make him your one thing and say, God, my one thing is not a political party. My one thing is not me. My one thing is you. Lord, wherever I am, whatever I go through, whatever happens tomorrow, God, who knows? We, we, we don't know whether we'll be alive tomorrow. But Lord, um, you are our one thing. You are our one thing. You are forever. Lord, I make you my one thing. God, give us hearts to seek you. Give me a heart to desire you above everything else. God, when I waste all that time on Netflix and uh, all that time doing other stuff and distracting myself and keeping myself busy, God, I pray that you'd 
Lord, shift the priorities of my heart that, that you would become my one thing, that seeking you, that going after you would become my one thing because that's the place where I'm transformed. Because one day when I'm old, when I'm looking back on my life, God, I, I, don't want, I know it's not all the things that I got done, all the busyness that's gonna count. It's who I became. Even going through the fiery trials, who did I become? Did I get better or bitter? And Lord, the difference is in seeking you and the disposition of my heart. Why don't you just ask him to open the eyes of your heart right now? Maybe when we talk about God's presence and seeing and perceiving God and um, sensing the presence of the Lord, maybe that's foreign to you. I just want you to ask him, whoever you are, just begin to ask him to open the eyes of your heart. Because just like we have natural eyes, the Bible says we have eyes of our heart to behold Him, to gaze upon His beauty. It's what you were born for. Not just to do stuff for God, for crying out loud. Jesus didn't die on a cross so you could do stuff for God. He died on the cross for a relationship to bring you to the Father so He could love on you. He is the eternal lover and we are the eternal receivers of that love. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord, to see your smile, to see your love pouring like a waterfall into my heart, overflowing. Lord, that whatever I go through, whatever situation I find myself in, God, I am walking in the abundance of the overflow of your wonderful transforming love in my life. Wow. Open the eyes of our hearts, Jesus, to see your glory, your generosity, your joy, your peace, your strength, your determination. Thank you, Lord, that you are not grumpy at us, but you are good and you love us and we live under an open heaven of your pleasure. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts and teach us to look at you, to behold you. Just keep your eyes closed. I remember reading a, a book by a mystic once and he said beholding God is like looking at the moon. When you first look at the moon at night, your eyes need to adjust. And at first it just looks like a, like a white disc shining in the sky. But as you gaze at the moon, slowly detail begins to form. You begin to see craters and, and, and different things and fascination starts to arise. And you begin to, I don't know, see the man in the moon. But details start to come out and it's the same as we gaze upon him. Instead of just thinking, oh God, because he's just God and glorious like the sun, we begin to see him for who he is. We begin to see the character of his heart and the details of his personality. David said in Psalm 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze, to gaze, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, with, with unveiled faces, we behold Him. We are being transfigured from glory to glory. Thank you, Jesus, for the transforming power of your love. That, Lord, although we're powerless to change our own hearts, you are the one who makes us pure. And, Lord, as we seek you, our hearts get more pure. And, Lord, we're able to see and experience more of you. God, may, God, may that be our ever-increasing reality, especially as the world grows darker. May your light within us and our ability to perceive your light around us in the world around us increase in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with that said, Amen.